Well, the motivation is that you don't have to use 12 hundredth of all of humanity's electricity to run the system. Um, the prediction is that next year, Iceland will spend more electricity on mining than on houses. Uh, so um, it's somewhat greener to have something that could run on my cell phone. In some ways, that's greener. Um, that's one, one advantage. Another advantage is that uh, you actually don't just get confirmations, and after a few confirmations, you feel better and better, but you never really know for sure. Uh, you actually reach a point within seconds where you are 100% sure, mathematically guaranteed, you know the consensus order. So it's not like you're going asymptotic to being sure. You just have a moment when you know for sure. And in some of our experiments, it's a fraction of a second. In some of our experiments, it's a few seconds. So that's another reason you might want to use this. Another reason is that you have fair ordering. There's no miner who gets to decide which transactions go in his block and what order to put them in. So that's another reason that you might use this rather than proof of work. So there's lots of, of reasons. Um, and so you get high throughput, you get the security, you get um, the fairness. Um, actually, DDoS security you do get with proof of work, which is nice. But the leader-based system don't give you that. So you know, there's all these trade-offs, but this gives you both. Yes? How do you update the, the code if we have to do a code update? Oh, that's really cool. So what you do is you send out a transaction that says we need to update the code, the code base. And everyone comes to consensus on the exact point in history where that transaction occurred. And then we all use the old code to process all the transactions prior to that point. And then from that point on, we all use the new code to process all the transactions from that point on. And we're done. So the update is sending the form of the transaction. Exactly. And the related question, how do we add and subtract people? Same answer. We want to add Joe as one more member of our community. We put out a transaction. And we all come to consensus on the point in history at which that transaction occurs. And when we do all of our voting, it's voting for a population that doesn't include Joe for everything up to that transaction. And then we switch over. And then all the future voting is using Joe as one of the members of the community. Same thing. He doesn't get to vote when we're trying to decide where his transaction that added him goes. But once we know that, then he gets to vote. The gossip about gossip with virtual vote and the, the hash graph thing just puts transactions in order. If the transaction moves money between two accounts, now you have a cryptocurrency. If the transaction involves giving the miners themselves or the full nodes themselves money because they were a full node, oh, and how do I know that you were a full node? Because I have a history of everything you've ever done. That's the beauty of the hash graph. So you get paid. But you can be paid by the community for being a full node. Um, well, if, if every transaction is being paid for by somebody, then they would have to pay an exponential amount to attack you. That's how markets work. Oh, the, it, does the hash graph grow? Oh, no. This is, this is the beautiful thing. Remember how I said that you don't just get more and more sure, but you actually reach a moment when you know for sure what, um, what the consensus order is on a transaction? At that point, you can use that transaction to update a shared state, and then you can throw it away. And you can throw away the event that holds it. So if you download the SDK and you run it, you'll see a hash graph grow up on the screen, and it gets bigger and bigger, and then it stops growing. Because it, it's constantly growing up at the top and throwing away stuff at the bottom, and it's staying a constant size for all of history. So any given transaction you only need to keep for a few seconds, we end up keeping it for about a minute just in case somebody else needs it, and then you can throw it away. So it doesn't grow forever, it's constant size. Then you could ask, but what about audit trails? Right? That's the natural next question. Glad you asked. <laughs> you have the flexibility to do it in several different ways. First of all, you could simply spool everything that you've received out to your hard drive, the whole hash graph, and keep the entire history of the hash graph on a bunch of hard drives. Um, it doesn't really slow you down very much because you don't ever have to read it. You don't have to put it in a database that, that can index it or anything. You just stream it out byte after byte to your multi-petabyte hard drive farm and you can just keep it forever. And the cool thing is that some of your full nodes might be cell phones, and some of your full nodes might be servers that have this petabyte farm to store things. And so some people store the whole history, and some people don't. You have complete freedom of what you want to do. Or you could just store the things you're interested in. Or you could do something cooler. What you could do, in fact, that's a good introduction to this. Swirls has the platform with an SDK that allows you to build apps on top of it. So the apps that you build determine the behavior of what is a transaction and what is its effect on the shared state and what is the shared state. When you build your app, 
you could build an app that says all transactions are stored as part of the shared state forever. So what that means is that when something goes into the hash graph, it stays there for a minute and then it's thrown away. But by that point, it's already had an effect on the shared state and the effect was we stored the transaction. So now everybody has to store all the transactions. Or you could have write your app where we store some of the transactions forever and other ones we don't. Or we store certain types of transactions for one year and certain types of transactions for five years and then we guarantee that they're deleted. Or we store the transaction for five years unless there's a government signed order that says that it is subpoenaed and it needs to last one more year and then it goes to a sixth year and then it's guaranteed to automatically delete itself. You can make arbitrarily complex audit trail type code. And once it is an app that's running on all the computers, as long as less than a third of us are evil, nobody can cheat. Nobody can prevent stuff from being stored when it should be stored and no one can prevent it from disappearing when it should disappear. And so it's a really powerful audit system because audit systems are important to make sure information doesn't disappear early, but some government regulations require that it does disappear at a certain point. And there's right to be forgotten and all sorts of laws about that. And so this will allow you to set up how you want things to be stored. You want it to be stored forever or for a little while or whatever. Um, and then maybe for some things you don't actually store all the transactions, but you store summaries of transactions. Uh, maybe daily summaries of, of what happened to an account. There's lots of different permutations you can do. And you do whatever you want in that app. So that is what we're doing. The hash graph itself imposes no overhead. You don't have to store things for years. You just store things for a few seconds or maybe for a minute. Um, but the app you write can store things for as long or as short as you want. It's up to you. Yes. I got two questions. Uh, first, yes. timestamps. So yes. we are heavily rely on timestamps based on like for voting or anything else. So how do we make sure the time is synchronized across the board between different uh, uh, components? So here's what we are doing. First of all, I have to assume that more than two thirds of us are honest. This is an assumption. If less than a third of us are bad or have bad clocks on our computer accidentally or on purpose or malicious or put timestamps a million years in the future in the past, if it's less than a third of us, I don't care, it's not gonna hurt us. We're going to end up taking the median of a bunch of timestamps. Okay. I send out my message. I take the median of when everybody received it. And so a few outliers really don't affect it very much. Uh, in fact, the fairness theorem, I can go through that with you if you'd like, sure. uh, proves that if less than a third of us are evil, then more than two thirds of us are honest. And what you're going to find is that when we make the list of all our times, the middle one on the list comes from an honest person or is between ones from two honest people. So the less than a third of us being evil cannot make the timestamp be a million years in the future or a million years in the past. And what about accidental errors? Well, we're taking the median. The median is about the best way you can to take a whole bunch of noisy measurements and, and get, get a single measurement that excludes uh, bad noise. Okay. It's much better than, say, the mean. Yeah. Um, or you could just say philosophically, uh, how would I say, when did something reach a community? I would just say, well, when did it reach most of the community? Well, how do I know when it reached most of the community? Well, I have to ask people. And that turns out to be equivalent to the median. So you can come at it from several different ways and you always get the same answer. I should take the median of the time that it reached people. Uh, and so that's what we're doing for the cool. timestamps. And if a few of our clocks have bad, a few of our computers have bad clocks, it doesn't matter. And of course, um, nowadays computers do periodically call other time servers to try to update their clock, but of course there could be problems with that and we have to re deal with those issues. Regarding the smart contracts and uh, yes. uh, suppose if Elias wanted to do a transaction with Bob and if he wanted to pull up the Bob's previous transactions, so uh, how would it uh, happen in the SDK provided like in the main and swirl state? Yes. Uh, I mean, how would Elias check the previous transactions of the Bob so that he mm -hmm. wouldn't uh, uh, do the transaction itself? Uh, like prior to sending the transaction so that he can pull up the information about the Bob? Sure. Um, so, so there's several different ways of doing this. Mm -hmm. Suppose what we want to do is that we have in our shared state the list of how much money each person has and what property each person owns. And you and I want to do an atomic transaction where I give you some money and you give me some property. I'm buying your property. What you would do is you would write your app in the main to create a transaction saying, I want to sell my property to Lehman. Here is the price that Lehman's going to pay me. Here's the property that I'm giving. Here's my transaction that says it. And as long as Lehman also signs a transaction like this with a consensus timestamp before noon on Tuesday, if they both come in before noon on Tuesday, then the community as a whole agrees that we have atomically swapped my money for your property. 
But if either of them is later than two no noon on Tuesday, or if either of them never happens at all, then the whole deal's off. So that's what you would do. And noon on Tuesday might be 10 seconds in the future, or maybe a minute in the future, or it could be a few seconds in the future. That would be you know, something like that. So then what happens is your transaction goes out to everybody, and they know that you have done your half of this deal because you digitally signed it. And if, um, if you're a full node, uh, you've digitally signed the whole event that it's inside of, and so you don't even have to sign the individual transaction, which is kind of nice. And I send out mine. I've signed it. Everybody sees these. Everybody comes to an agreement on the ordering of everything, which in this case doesn't matter at all, and the timestamp of everything, which matters a lot. And then they simply see when the second one finally gets its timestamp, they say, did both of them happen before noon on Tuesday? And if they did, every computer locally in its RAM has this array of how much money everybody has and this array of what property everybody owns. And they just decrement how much money I have and increment how much money you have and then do the opposite to property and we're done. And so the atomic transaction happens in parallel on everybody's computer. Ah, oh, but what if Alice is evil and Alice doesn't do it right? Well, this is interesting. So Alice just, um, you know, gives you my money without giving me the property. Or maybe Alice just creates some money out of thin air. It's just an array in her computer. She just increments one of the numbers. What will happen? Well, first of all, every round, we all take a hash of our current state. And we digitally sign that hash and send it out as a transaction. And so we all, very rapidly, within you know, a fraction of a second after the end of a round, and the rounds happen multiple times per second, but we very rapidly after the end of a round, we all know what the signatures were on that state. And if more than two-thirds of us are honest, then more than two-thirds of us are going to sign off on this hash that reflects the arrays with the right numbers in them. Alice tried to create money out of nowhere or make our deal not happen right. So her state was different. So the hash of her state is different. So she signed it. Her signature doesn't match our hashes. And we all just say, well, more than two-thirds of us voted the same way. Alice was an outlier. I'll ignore Alice. And now we're done. She has failed to forge money counterfeit money, and she has failed to interrupt our transaction. Plus, guess what we all have now? We have on our hard drive the state at that point in time, the hash of the state, and, trans and signatures for everybody in the world, or more than two-thirds of the people in the world, on it. And that block together, you can take to a court of law and prove that you and I actually did the transaction. And so it isn't only the full nodes that know it. We can easily prove it to a court of law. And of course, if we're storing in a Merkle tree, you just have two paths through the Merkle tree, a hash, a list of signatures, and you're done. You have a very small thing you have to give the court. So we get cryptographic proofs of the community agreeing that our atomic transaction really did happen or really didn't happen. Do you do any kind of uh, predictive analytics on the hash graph, or is that something that you're planning to? OK, probably not what you have in mind, but we just added um, a few hours ago in the release of the SDK, uh, a predictive system that actually has some really cool properties. So deep analytics, I mean, the whole field of how, what do you do with analyzing graphs for analytics is an enormous data mining is just really cool. And I am very excited about the point that, about the fact that it's really easy for anybody just to spool the whole hash graph out to disk. And you, get, you could get a hash graph that goes for years, and then you could do data mining on it. And what would you see? You would see things about internet weather. You would see things about how the algorithm is working. You would see things about how the participants are participating and learning things about the economy of what's going on. I just love the idea of doing deep data mining on this thing. But we haven't done any of that. We've just done a little bit. Actually, we do a little bit. Um, if you run the SDK, one of the um, tabs actually draws the hash graph on the screen. And by default, it checks it where it's um, multiple, um, it's expanded out. So Alice actually has multiple columns. And the way it works is that for every pair of people in the world, you have sort of a swim lane of two lines with uh, two vertical lines, and you see all the little lines between them. At a glance, you can see that maybe Bob is talking less often than everybody else. It's just visually obvious to you. Or you can see Bob keeps slowing up and s speeding up and slowing down and speeding up and slowing down. It's just obvious from the graph. Um, and you know, over the last two years, we've done lots of debugging, just looking at the graph, and just you see where the gray is and where the gray isn't, where it's white. Um, you could also see if, for example, Alice is talking to everybody and Bob is talking to everybody, but they never talk to each other. 
that would show up really clear. It's one white column in the middle of all these black columns. Just really obvious. So there is cool stuff you can do with that. None of which is what we just released. Uh, the, the most recent release of the SDK has this cool feature, which we will get into if you guys are interested in how um, not only does your app consensus transactions, it also learns the non-consensus transactions in case you want to react to them sooner. And what we've just added is that it actually does self-monitoring to do then predictions on when a transaction is going to have its consensus timestamp. So even before we know the, the, consens the uh, consensus timestamp on a transaction, it will give you its best guess. And over time, the ordering actually gets better as we get closer and closer to knowing the truth. Then when we know the truth, the ordering, of course, is perfect. And so that is a kind of self-analytics that is now exposed to the program and is actually useful for useful things like a real-time game. And the game demo app actually makes use of it and is really smooth and uh, you can run it. It looks cool. Um, but, um, but that's a type, a very primitive form of self-analytics, analyzing the hash graph, collecting statistics. I think there's 65 different statistics now that it takes on itself and just keeps track of 65 different running, transaction, uh, running statistics and puts graphs on the screen for you. It's all built into the SDK. Uh, you get that for free. Um, but that's just scratching the surface. I think there's really cool data analysis you could do on a hash graph.